In retrospect, it's pretty amazing that Barack Obama got as far as he did. In 2004, the summer of 2004, Barack Obama gave the keynote address at the Democratic Convention in Boston. And when he walked to the podium, probably only a small percentage of people in the room knew how to pronounce his name. He was totally unheard of. No one knew Barack Obama. At the time, he was a state senator in Illinois. Four years later, he once again spoke to the Democratic Convention, but this time as the nominee. Meteoric doesn't begin to describe it. How did this happen? Well, the outlines are fairly well known, though rarely talked about. A small group of Democratic donors, mostly in Chicago, decided that Barack Obama was their guy. He was the vessel for their ambitions. They paid for his campaign. They paved the way for his rise. He spent two years pointlessly in the United States Senate preparing to run for president in 2008. And of course, in the end, he won. But the question was, who was this man? Where did he come from? What did he spend his life doing before he became president of the United States? Well, the news media, whose job it is to answer those questions, spent the entire 08 campaign trying to keep you from knowing the answers. By election day, most Americans knew only one thing about Barack Obama, other than he was handsome and a good communicator, hope and change. But they knew nothing about him, his origins, what he believed, and Legitimate questions about those facts were turned away, as they often are, with the claim, that's a conspiracy theory, you're crazy, shut up. One of the most interesting moments in the 2008 campaign occurred when a man, like Obama himself, came from out of nowhere to recount his experiences with Barack Obama the man. His name was Larry Sinclair, and he told an amazing story. He said that in 1999, he had encountered Barack Obama in Illinois, had sex with Barack Obama, and then used cocaine with him. Sinclair went on to make these claims publicly at a, the National Press Club in Washington, to sign a sworn affidavit, and to take a lie detector test. But he was dismissed. In fact, he was attacked. Obama shills like Ben Smith of Politico batted the claims out without refuting them. They're absurd. And the rest of the media followed suit. But the claims weren't absurd. We're not claiming they're true, but they were certainly credible. This was a firsthand account of Barack Obama's behavior by someone who was willing to sworn, sign a sworn affidavit to that effect. So the question is, whatever happened to Larry Sinclair? What's his life been like since? That's an interesting story. It turns out Larry Sinclair is still alive. He lives in Mexico, but today he's in our studio and we're happy to have him. Larry Sinclair, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, where did you meet Barack Obama? Uh, it was by accident. I was in the Chicago area in 99 for Lee Duke's graduation from the Naval Academy. Who's he, Lee Duke? He's basically my godson. Okay. Um, I had hired a limousine service. Did, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you live in Chicago then? No. No. I was actually living in Colorado. I had flown in the night before. Okay. So I um, had hired a limousine service, had made it the driver aware that if Lee couldn't leave the base, because once they graduate, some of them actually get their assignments and they're shipping out and they can't leave the base, that I was still interested in going out and had asked the driver if he knew anybody that was available that might want to show me, you know, Chicago. And he said he did. So well, who was the driver? Uh, his name was Jameer um, Motani. It was with Five Star Limo. Um, so you're just a guy who's in town for the night, and it sounds like you're looking to party, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what you're really saying. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, I was in town for a few nights, but yeah, I was definitely looking to party. And Did you make that clear to the driver? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was no misunderstanding. How, how, how direct were you about that? Uh, extremely. <laughs> Extremely. Extremely. Okay. Yeah. There was there was no doubt what I was looking for. Okay. Uh, and he picked me up at my hotel in Gurney and drove into Chicago, pulled up in a bar outside, and there's this guy that's introduced to me as Barack Obama. It was literally that casual. That Had you ever heard of him? No. Did the driver know him? Yep. The driver definitely knew him because the driver said that he was a friend. Interesting. 
what how would the driver be friends with Barack Obama? I only found out later of uh, dealing with a reporter from Bloomberg News that apparently the limousine company had been doing business with Tony Resco oh. that at the time was somehow as affiliated was with in Barack Obama's Obama. Orbit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. So he knew Barack Obama. And in his view, Barack Obama liked the same kind of partying you were looking for. Yeah. Okay. So sex and drugs, in other words. Well, yeah, the sex part I wasn't so sure about until, of course, you know, you, you make your move. But it became obvious very quick. Um, the coke part I thought was interesting because of the way that I had brought it up. So I'm stepping on your story. So you pull up, and I apologize. So you pull up to this bar. The driver is basically scouting some dude for you to hang out with. Correct. There's this guy, Barack Obama. Have you ever heard of Barack Obama? Never. Time? Okay. Never. Um, we're having drinks. I mentioned the fact that I could use something to wake up. I was extremely exhausted. So you went into the bar? <clears throat> yes, sir. What kind of bar was it? I'm trying to remember. I've been trying to remember the name. I know that the glasses had three X's on them uh -huh. uh, because I remember taking one home. Uh, for a friend of mine. What, but I mean, generally characterize it. Was it, it a was, it working was class up, bar, no, gay bar, upscale, strip bar? It was upscale, quiet, wasn't really that, uh, that really didn't have a lot of energy to it. It was yep. more relaxed, more like a lounge as opposed to somewhere where people would go and get loud and crazy. Yeah. Um, which made it easier to talk. Um, but like I said, when I brought up the fact that I could do something to wake up, um, he immediately knew what I was referring to, um, had made it clear that I was looking for Coke and I really was and had made the suggestion that he knew where we could get it and we left to go get it. Interesting. Did he say what he did for a living? No. I had no idea that he was a representative in the Illinois House. I had no idea he was in politics. I just knew that he was supposedly married and at the time was going through some, some issues with the marriage. Did he say that? That was made clear, yeah. Huh. Um, did he say what kind of issues? No. Do you remember? No. So you said, I'm looking for someone to wake up. He knows you're referring to cocaine. I know where to get it. What happens next? We get back in the limo. The driver takes us wherever it is that Barack had instructed him to take us. I had given Barack $250 to pay for Coke. He gets out, comes back. Um, I start putting a line on a CD tray uh, to snort. Uh, and you're, you're in, in the, the limo. limo? Yep. Driving or parked? No, the driver's driving. Yep. I start to put a line on a, on a CD tray. And I just happened to notice that he pulls something else out of his pocket. And next thing I know, he's got a little pipe and he's smoking. So I don't have an issue with it. I mean, some people smoke, some people snort. Smoking the cocaine. Yes. So as I'm doing a line, I just start. This is the part where you, you know, you kind of make your move to, to see where things are going. So I just started rubbing my hand along his thigh to see where it was going. And it went the direction I had intended it to go. Um, so the night became somewhat active sexually and drug wise in the limo. Um, so you hit on him. Did he seem shocked by that? Not at all. Yeah. I mean, if you're smoking crack with a stranger in the back of a limo. Like, you got to imagine things are, might go crazy places. Well, not only imagine it, I look at it this way. I, look, I've done a lot of crazy things in my lifetime. I'm a pretty good judge of character, and I pretty much know whether or not I can move in a certain direction with an individual. I didn't feel that I was going in the wrong direction. I just wasn't so sure how much I could trust the individual right. at, at first. Um, and that was probably one of my bigger concerns. But the fact that I was already becoming somewhat buzzed, eh, you kind of throw caution to the wind. You weren't sure you could trust the individual. What does that mean? He, 
when you meet someone out of the blue and you go to a level that you're doing drugs with or you're giving money to purchase drugs or even for sexual activity, you have to be sure that you can trust them. And when I say trust, I mean that you're not going to end up being robbed or that you're not going to end up having a knife stuck into you, right. you know, from one direction or another, or that you're not going to pull up somewhere and all of a sudden the car door is going to open and you got five people pulling you out of it. Totally. That's what I mean when I yep. say trust yep. someone. And, and, you, and you've been around at this point oh, in yeah. your life, big time. Yeah. Right. So probably not your first time in a situation like this. Not at all. And and that's why I said I pretty much know where I can go and, and yeah. at, at what point. Um, so you start rubbing his leg and he's, I mean, I, I think, I was be totally blunt with you, like a man who's not into gay sex would be like, whoa, 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 whoa sound settle okay. down. Trust me, if it was something that you were not interested in, yeah. Uh, and you're right. I've had guys that uh, I read wrong that would literally try to break your hand. For uh, sure. If, if you went in that route. So it, it's not like this was something that he wasn't into. It's yeah. not something that he was shocked by. Yeah. Uh, shocked by you don't get excited and you don't unbutton your pants and you don't just sit there and let it happen. Yeah. So it wasn't it definitely wasn't Barack's first time uh, that much. I'm I'm absolutely certain of. Uh, and I would almost be willing to bet you it wasn't as last. So, um, so you performed oral sex on Barack I did. Obama. You did. Um, w in, in the driver's up front. Yep. And he's cool with this. The driver has the partition up. He didn't have a problem with it. He didn't put it down for any reason. I mean, he kind of set up the whole thing for this in the first he, place. Exactly. And I have a funny feeling he had no, uh, bones to pick with it as far as what took place. In yeah. It. Um, so what happened after? Uh, afterwards, I actually went back to my hotel. I had specifically asked that he drop Barack off first, but for some reason he and Barack chose that they would drop me off at the hotel first and then he would take Barack. So Barack actually made the drive out to Gurney, which is a suburb outside of Chicago, um, to the hotel for me to be dropped off. What hotel was it? It was the Comfort Inn in Gurney. Ooh, that sounds depressing. It, well... You have to remember it was 99 yeah, no, I <laughs> and it was close to the Great Plain, Great Lakes Naval facilities. Yeah. But um, I got dropped off. They left. Uh, the next day was somewhat interesting because he ends up showing up at my hotel room, which I thought was somewhat weird, but he wanted some more. Mm -hmm. So when you say he showed up, he just he showed up. I mean, I had no warning. I was in the room. There's a knock on the door. I opened the door and he's standing there. And he's standing there with more coke and he comes in. And it was just like a quick, you know, rehash or rerun from the night before. Exact same program. Exact same program. Was he smoking again? Yep. So Barack Obama smokes crack and then you perform yep. full sex on him. And the, like I said, the only reason I had come out in about it is I had reached out to the campaign even in 2007, only because I saw all these kids getting excited about it. Okay, wait, just, I, I just, so how did that end? Like Same way. So you get off, you finish smoking, you leave. Like, thanks, bye? Mm -hmm. Huh. What did you think of him? I thought it was interesting. Uh, I thought it was definitely a con. But what do you mean by that? Well, in my life at that point, you had you you made it clear I had already been around. Yeah, big time. Yeah. So, you know when people are doing things because they actually really enjoy it or they're sincere or they're looking, you know, for yeah. a connection or they're doing something because they're looking for an in or they're looking for a hook or it's a game. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I felt that it was a game for him. It, it was like, OK, what am I going to get out of it? Or is there something I can get out of it other than just, you know, the sexual part? Right. And lucky for me, I wasn't going back to Chicago anytime soon. So it really didn't matter. So you were left with a bad taste in your mouth. Something, yeah, yeah. 
Um, did you talk to him again? I did not. In fact, I... And did you have any idea? Even though you had sex with him twice, you did cocaine with him, watched him smoke crack twice, you had no idea who he was. I had no idea who he was until I'm sitting in my house in Tequala, Nagate, Mexico in 2004, and he walked on that stage. In Boston. In the DNC convention, and I literally hit the floor. I just hit the floor and was- Wait, so you're watching the Democratic convention from Mexico. I was and laughing. And the guy that smoked crack in your comfort in with you. I was laughing so hard. And you were sure it was him. I was absolutely positive. How? You, I don't forget people I've met. I don't forget people I have spent time with. I just don't. And just to just to restate, because I think you affirmed this, but um, he used his real name. When you yes. Him. Did he call himself Barack or Barry? Barack. Barack. Mm -hmm. And so did the driver. And that's why at first when everybody was referring to him as Barry, I just didn't understand or, or, or catch on. Because like I said, I didn't know that much about him other than the fact that, hey, you know, y you you hook up, you know, today it's grinder. Back then it was, you know. The limo driver. Yeah. A limo driver or a bartender, you know. You ask and somebody knows somebody or somebody doesn't. Amazing. Amazing. So you're sitting there in Mexico watching this and you think, that's the guy I had sex with who smoked crack it with me. Yep. And what do you think? Like I said, I just started cracking up. I freaked out. I had even pointed out to some friends of mine that were at the house that night. And I told them, I said, you're not going to believe this. I said, I blew this guy twice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they just start cracking up. But that's the thing about me. I've never been in the closet. I've never hid. I mean, I'm always very direct and blunt. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I'm just like, this is unreal, you know? And I had no idea that he was gonna run, you know, in 2008, but I was back from Mexico, but it, it was a strange feeling sitting there watching him walk across that stage and realizing who he was. Huh. So what did you do? You said you reached out to the campaign? Well, I didn't do anything in 2004, but when he, announced his run for 2008, I did reach out to the campaign in late 2007 because I had seen a lot of these college kids talking about how thrilled they were, how there was a, a candidate who was completely honest about his entire life, his drug use, you know, what he did as, when he was in school. You know, the constant back and forth, one minute is, yes, I did cocaine when I was younger, or no, I never did cocaine, but I smoked weed. So I just simply pointed out that all I was asking was, look, why don't you just simply come out and say, I did coke and I've done it as recently as 1999. You know, just tell the truth. Put it out there and be honest and let it stay as the truth rather than this back and forth. Um, never did hear anything back uh, from them immediately. How did, who did you reach out to? Do you remember? I reached out to actually David Axelrod's office in Chicago. I'm trying to remember the letters because it was actually three letters. And did you say I had sex with Barack Obama? This is the interesting part. My first contact with the campaign never mentioned the sex whatsoever. Um, that was actually brought to my attention by someone who eventually reached out to me in late 2007, claiming to be with the campaign, but wasn't with the campaign. What, what do you mean that was pointed out to you? So you never told I anyone never, in the Obama campaign you did sex with Barack not Obama? Not in 2007, no. Interesting. But they knew? How? Who? Well, that's I'm, weird. I'm assuming Barack himself because the phone calls that I got in late 2007 came from a gentleman that I have uh, repeatedly identified as Donald Young. And it was Donald Young who had mentioned to me that the campaign was not going to acknowledge the sex and the drug uh, interaction 
And I was somewhat taken back because, like I said, I had never mentioned the sex to the campaign at all at that point. I had in 2008, but I had not in 2000. Okay, that is amazing. And I want to get to who Donald Young was in just a minute. But I and I, I apologize for being a bad interviewer. But let me just ask the obvious question, which what was Obama like on crack? Actually, and <laughs> I hate to say this because some people are going to think I'm really crazy. Uh, I knew a lot of people that smoked it because I was in Miami in the early 80s when it became quite popular. Um, similar to a friend of mine that I knew in Miami gets extremely high, calm, almost euphoric. Um, and then as it starts to come down, you know, the twitching and the looking, anything that looks white that's sitting on the seat or, or the, uh, the floor, you assume is another piece that fell off that, you know, yeah. you can pick up and smoke. But um, while he was high, pretty much the same. Pretty controlled. Pretty controlled, euphoric, um, talkative, but not really saying anything. So it was like his presidency. A lot like it. Um, was it your impression, and of course you wouldn't, Strictly speaking, no, but was it your impression that this was the first time you'd ever smoked crack? No, no, uh, you don't. First of all, you don't buy crack, get in a limo and have a pipe in your pocket if it's the first time you smoke crack. Yeah. You just mm. don't. That makes sense. So um, I, I've read about your story to the extent it's been written about not very much. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd never read that Donald Young, this man Donald Young, called you and told you that he knew you'd had sex with Barack Obama. That was the contact in late 2007 that I had that originally came under the guise that they were, the, they were part of the Obama campaign. So who was Donald Young? Donald Young was a choir director and a school teacher. He was the choir director at Jeremiah Wright's church in Chicago, the same church that Barack Obama went to. Uh, he was also a very openly gay black yes. man, uh, but very well respected. Did you know him? I had never met him. I had not even realized that the person who was communicating with me had been killed uh, until a good two months after. So uh, I'm, I'm going to get to that. So Donald Young is the choir director at Jeremiah Wright's church. Yes. And is it publicly confirmed that he knew Barack Obama? Oh, yes. Yes. Donald Young's own mother has repeatedly said that she feels that her son died to protect Barack Obama. It's just interesting that Donald Young would have called you. He's not working directly for the campaign that we know of. Exactly. But somehow he has a copy of your letter. It sounds like maybe Donald Young was on cleanup duty. Somehow he has my phone number. Exactly. And that's exactly what it was. Because like I said, the first calls were, it was, I was led to believe that he was with the campaign. The last conversation that i had had with Donald Young, he had actually come clean and said that he had been asked to call me and that his job was to get as much information from me as far as who I had spoken to, who I had given any information to, uh, and to get that to them. Uh, he had told me to be careful, to watch myself, and to understand that the Barack Obama campaign was not in any way, shape, or form going to acknowledge anything or come out about anything. And he had made it clear that he had known Barack for quite some time and had had an intimate relationship with Barack for quite some time. He told you that? Yep. And that's when I knew that I could at least trust what I was being told. Um, originally, I had made it clear I didn't feel comfortable with the phone call because something just didn't seem right. But after a couple of calls, it started to all fall into place. And I had said the same thing to myself. Wait, so you didn't know Donald Young existed? Nope. It sounds like you're not very political anyway. You weren't. At the I time. wasn't at the time. And you were just annoyed that Obama was talking about cocaine and lying about it. 
I was extremely annoyed. But the sex part had nothing to do with it. No. Then Donald Young, who you don't know, never heard of, calls up and says, by the way, I know you had sex with Barack Obama. I did too. Yep. Pretty much. Um, I mean, this is a longer conversation, which we're going to have in a minute. But I mean, Obama has a wife and kids, and he's telling America what a great family man he is. Is that, or maybe you've seen this a lot. I, what, what do you think of that? Well, you know, in 2008, I made it clear that Obama was having marital problems in 99, and everybody uh, in the world said that I was crazy, didn't know what I was talking about. And yet, what was it, six months ago, Barack Obama comes out and tells the world that exactly what I said was the truth. In 1999, he and Michelle came very close to divorce. Really. 15 years later, what I say is the truth, but 15 years earlier, I'm a liar and a fraud. It's interesting how things eventually come out. But yes, I, believe me, I've seen, I've known guys that were completely happily married that will screw around uh, with another man on a weekly basis and think nothing of it. Huh. Was it, is, is it your sense that that's who Obama is, just transactional or that he's bisexual or like, what is this? No, my feeling that Barack Obama is probably He's definitely bi. Um, I think it, there is a lot of transactional uh, qualities to him because I think whatever he does, it is looking for a hook or looking for a benefit. Yeah. Uh, that, that's consistent with his public persona too, I would say. Um, so Donald Young calls you, you actually end up, sounds like you kind of like and trust Donald Young. I did. Um, did he say how long he'd had a relationship with He Obama? had just said that they had been intimate for years. Intimate for years. Um, and what happened to Donald Young? Donald Young was shot dead in his apartment, second floor in Chicago, Illinois. I think it was December 23rd of 2007. 2007. According to the police report and the death certificate, multiple gunshot wounds, uh, close range, no forced entry second floor apartment yet not a single resident in the building heard a single shot but yet they can hear every shot that's fired in the street outside um jeremiah wright announces that donald young's dead earlier that morning even before it was announced he, even before he was declared dead i mean a lot of it just didn't make sense um, this is all public and you can yep. look this up and um, it's still on the internet. Uh, tell us about Don Young's mother. Norma Jean Young actually is a former Chicago Police Department employee. Really? Really. She has worked for the Chicago PD. Um, I had spoken with his sister Lorraine shortly after I realized that he was the gentleman that I had been speaking with. Uh, there were people at the time that were attempting to have Lorraine uh, and other members of Donald's family file criminal complaints against me with Chicago because they wanted me arrested. They were trying to get the family to say that I was trying to con them or something. Uh, to my knowledge, they never uh, did any such thing. Uh, but at the same time, I, I continue to respect Lorraine and the rest of the family. Um, but Mrs. Young had finally come out and told David Nelson, who was a reporter that I knew out of Minnesota, uh, that she was convinced that Donald had been killed, that his death was to protect his friend Obama. And she confirmed that they had, in fact, been extremely close for years. Um, I mean, did she confirm that they'd had sex, Obama and Donald Young? Her confirmation wasn't referencing, or she did not specifically say that they were sexually involved. She just simply said that they had been intimate friends for, for years. But she believed the Obama campaign was she, responsible. She believed that his death was due to protecting Barack Obama. And I made the same argument that people said, well, how are you accusing Barack? I said, I'm not accusing Barack of anything. But I said, I'm willing to bet my life 
Did Barack Obama and Jeremiah Wright both know or have knowledge of who killed Donald Young? There is no doubt in my mind about that. Well, this was a guy who was clearly going to be the next leader of, of the world. You know, people kill each other over insurance claims, over bar fights. And there's a lot at stake here. I, mm -hmm. I have no knowledge of this. I'm not alleging yeah. uh, a murder by the Obama campaign or its allies, but it, it's not. It's not a crazy thing to wonder, obviously. No, and the only thing I, after I realized what had happened with Donald Young, the only thing I'd ever asked was the same thing that I had done. And I said, you know, if you want to accuse me of being crazy, you know, release your phone records, you know. Turn over your phone records from your phone in 99. Turn over your phone records for the last year. I mean, it's that easy. If you've got nothing to hide, it's not like they're going to be made public. Turn them over to authorities. Let them investigate. Let them look. But no. So um, I, now seems like a fair time to ask about your, your motive. So your initial motive was you were annoyed because you believed or you knew that mm -hmm. Obama was lying about his drug use. Right. But then after the Donald Young exchange where he brings up the sex that you had with Obama, um, what's what was the point at which you decided, I'm just going to bring this to the country? I'm going to go public. Well, in January of 2008, after having contacted uh, the campaign yet again, I had decided, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to make a YouTube video and put it up, which I did. Um, it wasn't because I was looking for anything out of it. In fact, if I had even stopped long enough to anticipate the blowback uh, and, and the consequences of speaking out, um, me being me, it probably would not have stopped me. It might have slowed me a little bit, but it would not have stopped me. But um, I figured if you're going to call him out, you can't call him out on part of it. And, and people have said, well, why didn't you just talk about the drug use and leave the sex out? And I said, because if I said he just used drugs and then you found out later it was drugs and sex, you would accuse me of lying because I didn't mention the sex. So my and the opinion was, if you're going to tell the story, then you tell the whole story and let the chips fall where they may. So that's exactly what I did. And so you made a YouTube video. By the way, I look. I looked for it last night. I couldn't find it. That's because YouTube gave access to my account to someone shortly after uh, the polygraph test, and I was never given access back to it before the video was actually deleted. <laughs> Are you serious? Oh yeah, YouTube gave access to the account, and the video was deleted. Microsoft gave access to my Hotmail account and all of my emails were circulating the internet and vacation replies were set up on my email telling people that I was busy uh, giving blowjobs and would get back with them when I was done and oh yeah. Man, they wanted Obama to be president. Yep, and they wanted me to be the biggest fraud and nutcase that ever existed. So I got to ask you, I mean, you know, I, I wasn't there. I can only assess what mm -hmm. you're saying. I don't see any obvious motive for you for gain, financial gain. You're not going to get rich doing this. And, and in fact, you haven't You've gotten impoverished uh, as a result of it. But like if I'm a reporter, well, I was a reporter at the time. I remember thinking, well, that's an interesting story. But it seemed like nobody in the media wanted to follow up with you. And some people like Ben Smith at Politico, who's a liar and a shill posing as a journalist. I, I reread the piece last night that he wrote saying, oh, it's ridiculous. Right off the, the first graph. It's ridiculous. These claims. Well, I think I have an answer for why a lot of reporters did not want to follow up. And I think it would have something to do with what David Axelrod told a old Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, reporter, or no, a Chicago Tribune reporter, uh, John Crudson. Uh, Axelrod had been a reporter in Chicago before okay. he went into politics. Well, John Crudson worked for the Chicago Tribune, and John Crudson actually came to Duluth, Minnesota, and sat down with me and, and talked with me. And John Crudson had, had told me point blank that before he had flown out, that he had spoken to Axelrod. 
and that Axelrod had told him that they were aware of who I was and that it was their intentions to destroy me and that if any reporter had mentioned me to them, they would be completely cut off and that outlet would be completely cut off from access to the Obama campaign for the duration of the year. So I think that had a lot to do with why reporters didn't bring things up to the campaign because everybody wanted access to, you know, the new savior. Nobody wanted to be blackballed and, and denied access to a historic campaign. Yeah, but I mean, if it's the guy's running for president and credible information comes out that he's smoking crack and having sex with dudes, I mean, that, that seems like a story. Well, it would be a story if the media really cared about telling people the truth about anything. Yeah, they're liars. And that Ben Smith is a liar. Oh, Ben Smith's more than a liar, but you're right. What do you mean more than a liar? He's a complete fraud. Ben Smith, you know, I hear people talking about grifters. Ben Smith to me is a grifter. Ben Smith wrote an article um, saying that I had a 27 year criminal, criminal history, career criminal. And the funny thing is, is if you look my criminal history up, which I've published myself and provided from day one, uh, my criminal history goes from 1980 to 1986. And everything I've ever done, I've owned it. I've never wasted taxpayer money. And any sentence I've ever been given, I've served. Um, but he also said that I was a fugitive, that I was avoiding prosecution. I was trying to prevent from going to jail. None of that was true. But the media ran with it, even Greta. Even Greta linked to it and said that people ask me why I would not interview Larry Sinclair. This is why. And she linked to Ben Smith's article. And notice his article was published right when I was preparing to do the press conference at the National Press Club. But hey, the National Press Club, so-called beacon for freedom of, of the press, they were just as involved in trying to keep the story from ever being... It's interesting. I, I watched... The other night, I watched your entire National Press Club appearance, and in it, you detail your intersections with law enforcement mm -hmm. in, in ex exhaustively. Yep. Every time you've been arrested, you explain it. Every time you've done time, you've exp yep. you explain it. So you didn't, from what I could tell, hide your past. No. Why? You, you can't. I mean, I've never hidden my past in regular, everyday life. Why would I hide it in something like this? So... Um, I mean, you're the only person on this set who's had sex with Barack Obama. So I think you're, I, 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 I don't know, expert on Obama, but you know more than most people. What's your assessment of him now? Uh, I think he's the same grifter that he's always been. I think he's still very power hungry. I think Obama is calling the shots in the current Biden administration really? more than people are willing to admit. Um, I think Obama is hell bent uh, I had made a statement during that press conference that I felt that Barack Obama being elected was going to push race, race relations in this country backwards 50 years. I am absolutely positive I was. <laughs> yes. I, well, I think you've been you've been vindicated on that <laughs> because race relations in this country has not only gotten pushed back, but everything's about race now. Everything. Everything is about victimization now. Um, I'm, it's interesting, though. Um, yeah, he's a, obviously a race hater, very anti-white, but he had sex with a white man. So you have to ask, like, is that real? Oh, for him, of course. I, and I would be willing to bet you I'm not the only white person he's ever had sex with or male anyone. Yeah. Um, but hey, he's got what he wanted. You know, he is in D.C. He's living the life he still looked upon as as being the savior of, of the country you know and sadly people are still giving him that power and i think it's going eventually to be to, to the detriment of can, can i just ask you one last question how did you it, that's it, i'm just thinking about it. it's very insightful because i i knew a lot of people who weren't liberal who voted for obama purely on the race question Mm -hmm. And they weren't all self-hating, guilty whites. They were like nice, normal people who wanted to see race relations improve. And that really was the core promise of his campaign. And a lot of people bought it. A lot of smart people bought mm -hmm. it. And I saw why they bought it. But you didn't buy it. 
How did you know that? I grew up in South Carolina in the 1960s and 70s, okay? I've been gay and knew I was gay since six years old. Never hit it, okay? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in rural South Carolina. And my first job as a kid was cropping tobacco for a family by the name of Rose that were a black family living across the road from my grandparents. Um, so I grew up as a kid, a gay kid, in an era and an area that would get you killed being gay just as quick as you could be hanging being black. So I actually knew the other side of the track before I knew that I was supposed to act like I was above this or above that. I've watched it my whole life. I know when someone plays, when it comes to acting like they're one way and then in reality they're the biggest racists or bigots alive on both sides okay i knew because he was saying one thing in the campaign and then if people started to actually listen to what he was saying remember there was a time when he actually told supporters to show up at a fight with a knife get in people's face argue with them if they didn't agree to support him if they didn't agree to vote for him argue with them convince them come on you don't make statements like that and tell me that you're not going to make things about race he did man that is that is the one part of your story that we can say unequivocally you're telling the truth about you saw that and most people didn't larry sinclair i'm really grateful that you came i wish i had interviewed you in 2008 i don't think anyone would have run the interview <laughs> <laughs> But um, anyway, thank you. You're welcome. Very much. Thank you. Great to meet you. You too.